Let's uh, start with the peace chant. Om Bhadram Karne Bhishunuyama Deva Bhadram Pashe Maksha Bhirya Jatra Sthirai Rangai Stushtvagam Sastanu Bhihi Vyashe Madeva Hitayadayahu Swastina Indro Vridhashrava Swastina Pusha Vishwaveda Swastina Starksho Arishtanemi Swastino Brihaspatir Dadhatu Om Shanti 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 Mantra number nine. Please repeat after me. Jagadita sthano, Vaishwanaro akaraha, akaraha, Prathama matra, Prathama matra, Apte radi matvadva. Apte radi matvadva, apno ti havai sarvan, apno ti havai sarvan, kaman adishcha bhavati, kaman adishcha bhavati, yayevam veda, yayevam veda. So this is where we had stopped last time. See, the Mandukya Upanishad, is both small and in its message is very compact. It has only 12 mantras and its message is the analysis of the self and the analysis of Om. So from mantra number 3 to mantra number 7, in mantra number 7 it came to a glorious climax, the analysis of the self. The self has four quarters it was said. The first quarter is what we experience in the waking. The second quarter uh, is what we experience in dream. Third quarter is what we experience within quotes uh, in deep sleep. And the fourth quarter, which is the point of all of this, is the real self, which is existence, consciousness, bliss, which alone appears as the other three quarters. <coughs> if you remember the terms, you know, the Vishwa, Taijasa, Pragya, Turiya. Vishwa, the waker, Taijasa, the dreamer, Pragya, the deep sleeper, and Turiya, the consciousness in itself. Now, in order to absorb this teaching, the Upanishad now goes on after the seventh mantra, the eighth mantra onwards till the twelfth, gives us a method of absorbing this teaching. That is the analysis of Om, which is the single most sacred word in the Indian traditions, not only Hinduism, but all Indian traditions. So this is the deepest meaning of Om that we get in the Indian scriptures. Uh, Om has, when you analyze Om, uh, analyze Om, it has four letters or four, um, the, it's not literally four letters, three letters and silence. So four matra, the correct term, Sanskrit term is matra. The self has four pada, four aspects and the Om has four matras. And what the Upanishad wants us to do is use Om to understand the real self, to come to an understanding, the realization of your real self, who you are of Turiyam. How do you do that? The Upanishad suggested in the eighth mantra that look, look at the symmetry. Om has four matras, A, U, M and silence. The silence which both succeeds Om and underlies Om. The silence which is there, which is evident when there is no noise, but even when there is noise, it underlies that, that noise. So, four. A, U, M and silence. Or in English we have put it, the closest is A, A U, M and then silence. At this point you might say, that the, I don't see any um, A or U, I see an O, right? If you look at Om, 
where is the A and the U? Well, as I mentioned last time, because of the rules of Sanskrit phonetics of Sanskrit grammar, the A and the U, when they are in proximity, they are pronounced as O. So, the A and the U are hidden in that O. Um, now, the Upanishad suggested, you can match or associate the four matras of Om with the four padas of the self. Pada means aspects of the self. And you can see in sequence, it suggests that you equate A or A with the waker. The, uh, then U with uh, the dreamer. M with the deep sleeper. And of course, it includes the waker and the experienced universe in waking, the dreamer and the experienced subtle universe of our minds, the dreams, uh, deep sleeper and the uh, um, deep sleep darkness or blankness, and the silence with Turiyam, with pure consciousness, existence consciousness, please. Make this association in your mind. Then chant Om, keeping that association in your mind. Mindfully chant long ohms, silently or in a low voice. Don't make a nuisance. Huh? Lots of ohm at, at home can lead to... <laughs> I was in the Bahamas where, uh, just the, I, I mentioned this, the cruise ships, huge cruise ships go. People go as tourists to the Bahamas. And it is in front of the ashram. And they have these big horns on the ships. <laughs> So it's a very booming kind of thing and it carries across the water, across the bay. Uh, and it sounds like Om, a very deep ba uh, bay's Om. And the monks there, they say that, Swami, look, the ships are Oming. <laughs> <laughs> so, chant it. And as you go through the Om, as A uh, fades into U, fades into M, um, Conjure up within yourself by association, by the power of association, your entire life, the experience of your life, the entire, our, the entire gamut of our experience of life is covered by waking, dreaming and deep sleep. So this life which we have, let it come before your eyes, the, the eye of your mind, dismiss it, then let the dream world, your mental world, your subjective world come before your mind's eye, your inner life. Dismiss it and the blankness, let it come before your mind's eye. Dismiss it as it fades into silence. As sound, Om, fades into silence, let the manifested world, the three worlds of waking, dreaming and deep sleep, fade away into consciousness. And you are that consciousness all the time. Not only at the end of Om, even during Om, not only Turiyam in itself, but during waking, during deep sleep, during dreaming also. So that's the whole point. Now, what the Upanishad will do in mantras 9, 10, 11 and 12, it will help us in this process. What is the process? Of matching Om with the self, the different aspects of the self. And so each mantra, the, eighth month, the ninth mantra helps us in matching Waking with a, uh, the tenth mantra will help us in matching dreaming with u, and the eleventh mantra will help us in matching deep sleep with m, um. and the twelfth mantra finally will conclude the Upanishad and match Turiya and silence. Um, remember, the conclusion of Om is not silent. You are not supposed to be silent. You are supposed to. But the silence should remind you of the pure consciousness which you are. So it's a consciousness pervading the silence which is the point of Om. That's the whole point of chanting the Om. So how do, how do we go about this matching? The Upanishad, the mantras, all of them have three aspects or, or three points. Each mantra, 9, 10, 11, 12, each mantra will make, come, come, come in. Come anywhere, there are lots of spaces here. Each mantra has um, three points to make. First of all, it will tell us 
what to associate with what. We know this already, but uh, we are getting ahead of ourselves. So what to associate with what, number one. The second thing it will tell us is why. You see, I'm saying that you associate a uh, with the waking, waking world. But when you associate two things, there must be some similarity, some link somewhere, some reason for associating. You can't randomly associate something with something. So why should I think of a uh, as my entire life, waking life? They'll give us reasons. These reasons are just, the, just by the way of helping you to make that association. The third point each mantra will make is, what is the result of uh, such, an, such a meditation? So what do you get if you associate a uh, with your waking universe and meditate on that and spend time thinking about that? Um, you will ask, what do you mean what result? Aren't, aren't we supposed to be enlightened? Yes, the, the ultimate result, the point of all of this is to realize that you are Turiyam. Correct. That's the whole purpose. But um, there's just a point in, come, come, come. There's a space here. There is a, um, just a point to understand, in traditional, in the Vedas, not only Vedanta, in the, in the Vedas, the way it is taught is, any kind of action has a result. So you do something to get something. This comes from the Vedic ritualism, where you perform a ritual in order to get a result. Now, a meditation is also a kind of action, a mental action. So, by that logic, you would expect a result from the meditation. So, that's why, keeping in that particular style, they will mention results. Suddenly, those results might seem strange, but it's, remember, it's the style of the entire Vedas. So, they will mention some results. The thing to keep in mind is, when particular meditations are prescribed in the Vedas, the results are of two kinds. One is a worldly result or otherworldly result. And second, a spiritual result. The spiritual result is what we are looking for. Enlightenment, that I will know that I am Brahman and go beyond sorrow and suffering. That's the point. But there is also, supposing someone is not interested in uh, that, but is interested in something more concrete and worldly, not us. It's not meant for us. Don't get diverted. So, somebody wants to be rich. Somebody wants to be learned. Somebody wants to be powerful. So, those worldly results are also promised. But they are only meant for those who have worldly desires. And why would they be promised at all? Because the Vedas have these two kinds of religion in them. One is a more conventional kind of religion where people go, you know, you see it in temples and churches all the time. People go to God for curing diseases, for success in life, for a healthy family, or things like that. So that my life goes well. Um, conventional kind of religion. So that was also there in the Vedas, which is the early part of the Vedas, the first part of the Vedas. And the second kind of religion is the spiritual, what we are looking for. Enlightenment, liberation. Nirvana, Moksha, whatever you call it. So these are reflected in the results you will see. Just I'm just mentioning it. As we go along, we shall see what I mean. The first one, nine. We did this last time. What does it say? The waking experience. In each experience, there is an individual consciousness associated with one body-mind. In the waking state, that one, that consciousness will be called Vishwa. But consciousness associated with the entire waking universe, that will be called Virat. So it says Virat, in the waking experience, it mentions, it just names Virat, but it you should include Vishwa also. This should be associated with Akara Prathama Matra, with the A, uh, the first. Remember, each mantra has three points to make. Point number one. What should be associated with what? Second point, why, how? Third point, result. So the first point is, what should be associated with the waker? Associate a uh, with the waker. Which a? Uh, the beginning of om. It's hidden in the o. Pratama matra. Why? 
how why a uh, why not something else because it says it gives two reasons apte radimatva dwa because of pervasion and because of its being the first pervasion means the virat it per just like the virat pervades the entire universe it's a consciousness which is associated with the entire universe similarly a uh, is the sound is the basic sound which gets modified into all other sounds i mentioned this last time you start with a uh, and then you as you change the position of your lips different sign, sounds come a uh, e u so that same effort is actually producing different sounds because a uh, is the basic sound which pervades all the other vowels and the vowels are the ground are the building blocks of speech of pronunciation and in the same way virat pervades the entire universe so make the connection that way another way of making the connection is adi matwa because it's the first a uh, is the first sound you produce when you open your mouth the first sound you make is a uh, like dentist say a uh. <laughs> so a uh. um and virat is the first of the gods to be manifested it's the first thing that appears in creation uh, tasmad virada jayat is one of the vedic hymns you find the first to be, be even before that god exists ishvara exists with maya but first manifested in this universe is virat so virat is the first which is manifested and as a part of virat is the entire universe and we are all parts as bodies and minds as parts of virat so virat is the first manifested a uh, is the first sound because of these reasons pervasion and being the first because of these these reasons connect virat or the waking to a uh, which means your own waking also to a uh. what result should we get what should we expect from this meditation the worldly result and the spiritual result the worldly result is sarvan kaman aap noti sarvan kaman just as virat pervades everything this person also uh, person, person who does this meditation who keeps on associating the entire universe with a uh, when he chants om so this meditation the result will be this person will expand pervade expand in terms of wealth and success and power and also and so forth will do very well millionaire so uh, sarvan kaman adishya bhavati and becomes and excels in every sphere of life just as a uh, or virat is the first this person will also become the first in every sphere what what do you call it summa cum laude, laude. <laughs> graduates <laughs> at the top of his class his or her class and uh, uh, does very well in family life in academic professions and what not and so on this is the promise for attracting customers so who are who are after these things why would the veda promise this the reason is that uh, it wants to entice people into a moral religious spiritual way of life that's why but it's not meant for us remember we are after spiritual, spiritual. spiritual. so what is the spiritual result promised that if you do this practice ultimately you'll realize that you are turiyam that's nine Ten. Swapnasthana, Tejasa Ukara, Tejasa Ukara, Dvitiya Matra, Utkarshat, Ubhayatvadva, Utkarshati. हवै ज्ञानसंततिम हवै ज्ञानसंततिम समानश्च भवति नास्य ब्रह्मवित नास्य ब्रह्मवित कुले भवति य एवं वेद टेंथ मंत्र इट टीचेस अस टू एसोसिएट उ विद our dream experience not just dream experience you can look at it this way even in the waking experience there are two aspects one is the physical world we live in 
So that is the gross or physical world we live in, that's the Virat. And there is the inner private life which we are experiencing right now. The world of our mind, of our thoughts, our memories, our inner life. So that's the subtle world. That's the world of the dreamer or the, the Hiranyagarbha, the cosmic mind. That's available right now also. Right now because of the preponderance of external, physical, gross experience outside. That's why we call this the waking universe and Virat. But the subtle universe is right here. In the dream state what happens is the waking universe is shut out. You live only in the mind. And it conjures up dreams. Anyway, my point is, uh, the point of the Upanishad is Swapnasthana. Now consider the dream state. You, the Taijasa, Taijasa associated with U. Where is the U? If you look at Om, there doesn't seem to be an U there, but it's actually hidden in the O. It's A and U together make an O in Sanskrit grammar. So it's there in the O. Associate the U with the dream experience. You the dreamer. Point number one. What do you associate with the dreamer? U. Why? Two reasons. Utkarshad ubhayatvad. One is because of excellence and because it excels, number one. And number two, uh, because it's in the middle. Second one is very self-explanatory. Because it excels and because it's in the middle. That's why the dream state should be associated with U. Now what do you mean it excels? How does the Taijasa or the Hiranyagarbha excel? What does it excel? It uh, excels the waking or the Virat. It excels that. How does it excel? Because it's subtler. The subtle always controls the gross. The mind controls the body. Um, the subtle is often the cause of the gross. The subtle is the cause of the physical. Um, it, in Vedantic thought or in Hindu cosmology, what happens is, Ishwara with the God, with the power of Maya, projects the five elements. You know, the ancient cosmology of five elements, space and air and fire and water and earth. And in, out of a mixture of those five elements, this entire physical universe is supposed to be formed. But a point there is often overlooked. Those five elements which are projected, they are supposed to be, they are what is called Sukshma Tanmatra. They are subtle in form. They are not the space we see here or the, the fire which we see, um, uh, flames which we see or the physical earth which we are standing upon. No, they are subtle elements which are perceptible to yogis maybe, they are mixed, those five elements are mixed to produce a physical world. My point being, the subtle is the cause of the gross. So the five subtle elements are actually the causes of the five gross elements which go to make this world. So from that point of view, the subtle exceeds, the subtle excels the, the physical or the gross because they are causes. Another way the subtle ex exceeds the, uh, excels the, the gross is because um, the gross is born of the subtle and when the gross disappears, when, the, in your, when you, at night you fall asleep, the physical body disappears and you remain as the subtle body of mind. At the end of the universe, when the whole universe is dissolved by, by Ishwara, the physical universe that's the Vedantic cosmology. The physical universe dissolves back into the subtle universe, the five subtle elements, before resolving back into Ishwara or God itself. So, it's the, the subtle universe, the, the dream or the Hiranyagarbha, the subtle universe is the place of dissolution of the physical universe at the time of the destruction of the universe. So, in that sense, the subtle is also said to be superior. Remember this all in terms of uh, cosmology, the, the old ancient cosmology. So in that sense also, the subtle is supposed to be superior to the gross. What's going on here? They are trying to just help us to associate. So, why should, we, should I associate U with the dream? Because the dream is, the dream level of the subtle universe is superior to the gross universe 
and the u is also superior to a u is superior to a how because it is the a uh, is the basic sound which is modified the u comes after a uh, in that sense in that sense u excels a uh. so just as u excels a uh, by coming afterwards don't you look puzzled don't overthink this <laughs> in fact look at it like a child would look at it a child would be convinced by this kind of reasoning okay <laughs> doesn't doesn't u come after a uh? yeah, yeah. Oh uh, yes, and so in that sense, U is better than a. Yeah, U is better than a. <laughs> U is better than a, and the subtle universe is better than the gross universe, and therefore connect the two. Another reason why you can connect the two is because ubhayatva, because in the, in the middle, clearly the dreamer is in the middle of the waker and the deep sleep. You wake up, uh, the waker goes into deep sleep. In between state is the dreaming state. U is in the middle of a uh and m. When you pronounce om, u comes in between. So because of being in between, you can connect the two. So because of these two reasons, u think of u as the entire dream universe, entire subtle universe, the cosmic mind. Keep it your entire inner world. Practically speaking, your entire inner life, hopes, desires, memories, regrets, frustrations, plans, knowledge, ignorance, memory, all of that, you connect it to U. When it comes to U, that's, that's the entire experience. All your Vedanta knowledge, all of that, U. So U is superior to A, uh, as the subtle is superior to the gross. I mean, in Sanskrit, why is the subtle? Why is sukshma superior to the sthula? In Sanskrit, they will say um, sukshmatvat, karanatvat, um, utpatti sthanatvat, laya sthanatvat, because it is subtler, because it is the it is it is the cause of the gross, because it is the source or the place of birth of the gross, it is the place of dissolution of the gross. Because of these various reasons, the subtle is superior to the uh, physical gross. Yeah. So we are in the uh, you know waking state and yeah. we are you know reading this or understanding this. Oh. So I try to you know understand this would be in the gross universe or in the I just mentioned a little while ago. These are not demarcated. The the gross universe and the subtle universe and the causal universe are not Strictly demarcated. When you have the gross universe, like when you are a body right now, here's a body and here is a physical universe. At this point, do you not have a mind? Yeah. Certainly. So the subtle universe is always there. When the gross universe is there, the subtle must be there. And beyond that, the uh, causal must be there. The causal, subtle and then gross. But the subtle can continue without the gross in your experience. So when you dream, you need not... What is the difference between a dream and uh, waking? In the waking, we are in touch with a physical universe through our sense organs. All this refers back to mantra 3. How through the, remember, through the 19, uh, 19 mouths, 19 uh, mouths, we are experiencing a physical universe. Eko nang minchati mukha. So we are experiencing a physical universe through our sense organs. That's the waking. But at that point, the mind is also there. So the subtle universe, it's not that the subtle universe is available only in our dreams. It's available in our minds. If you look into your minds, in fact, in one of the karikas, Shankaracharya mentions this. I mean, in Gaudapada says something and Shankaracharya comments upon it. In one of the karikas, Gaudapada says, earlier karikas, which we have already done, Gaudapada says, meditate upon the taijasa in the mind. Uh, where he said Dakshinakshe Vibhur Vishwam Manasyantastu Taijasa uh, Do you remember there was a karika in which uh, Gaudapada said meditate upon the waker in the right eye meditate upon the dreamer in the mind Shankaracharya in the commentary which at a point I did not raise at that time Shankaracharya in a commentary to that karika he says 
that the master means in the waking state itself. Here itself you can find the waker. Here itself you can find the dreamer. If you pull yourself away from the world and sink into deep thought, how is it different from the dream world? If you sink from deep thought into absolute silence in meditation or just quietness, how is it different from the deep sleeper? So here itself you can find all three. All right. So relate these two. What will you get if you relate these two? What are the worldly results and spiritual results if you meditate like that? One is Utkarshati, the person excels. The one who does this meditation excels. How? Where does this person excel? Jnana Santatim Utkar. He excels in knowledge. This person um, becomes, um, um, you know, you get a PhD from Colombia or uh, and uh, uh, or. Uh, and become a full professor, write books which are taught in universities, or even get nominated for the Nobel Prize, or even win it. Something like that. Uh, there are many stories in uh, India of people who worship God for knowledge. Mm-hmm. Not spiritual knowledge, not ultimately God realization, but some kind of um, philosophical knowledge, um, worldly knowledge, even religious knowledge, but not ultimate God realization. So in India, the concept of worship of Saraswati, God in the aspect of knowledge is conceived of in a female form as as a deity, Saraswati, clad in white. And um, in fact, Sri Ramakrishna said about Holy Mother that she is Saraswati, she has come to give knowledge, spiritual knowledge. So the worship of Saraswati is actually something like this. If you worship Saraswati, the, the gain is that the little kids, they all believe they're going to get by their exams, <laughs> do well, at uh, get good grades if they worship Saraswati. So Saraswati is very popular among students, <laughs> even as, as you would expect. And her sister, Lakshmi, who is the giver of all wealth. So Lakshmi is very popular among businessmen. <laughs> so uh, worship of Lakshmi is a bit like the first one which we saw just now, little while ago. This, the ninth mantra and the 10th mantra is more like the meditation on on u is more like the worship of saraswati knowledge there are multiple stories um, there is a story of how uh, panini got the shiva sutras maheshwara sutras uh, who was going to uh, who who devised the whole system of grammar so he meditated upon um, upon Shiva and Shiva revealed to him the, the, the sutras which becomes the aphorisms which becomes the basis of the entire classical Sanskrit grammar so he, he worshipped God he was not, supposed to be not a very brilliant person otherwise so he, he worships God and gets all this knowledge fantastic knowledge about grammar um, I also told you the story of the great non-dualist Sri Harsha I think I've, I don't know if I it's worth repeating um, if you think these are difficult, probably the most difficult book and very profound book of um, Advaita Vedanta, non-dual Vedanta, is a book called Khandana Khanda Khadya, which means the pastries of non- uh, refutation or the delicacies, cookies of non- ref- refutation, <laughs> sweetmeats, sweets of refutation, of refuting. Uh, other other philosophical points of view. Don't worry, we won't study that. <laughs> I can barely understand a bit of it myself. It's extraordinarily difficult. But the story behind that book is even more interesting. The story goes that Sri Harsha, the author, his father was a scholar of non-dualism. And in the court of the king at that time, his father was defeated by a dualist, a Nayaika scholar, a logician. So he was an, his father Sri Harsha's dad was a non-dualist, but probably didn't do his homework too well. So in the debate he was defeated and he was imprisoned or some say drowned by the king for uh, his failure or something like that. And Sri Harsha vowed revenge on the dualists, that he would defeat all the dualists. And remember all this defeating is uh, not fighting physically, but intellectually. So he would defeat the Dualists, the logicians, the Nayaikas. That was his vow. The only hitch was he was dumb. 
I mean, there's no other way to put it. He, 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 was, he was not the brightest kid in the class. So now he thought, how do I go about it? I'm no match for the logicians. Um, so he prayed to God. He prayed to the Divine Mother for knowledge. So something like this. I don't know if he, he prayed, did this kind of meditation. So to get knowledge in order to defeat the non-dualists, uh, to the dualists. And so the Divine Mother appeared before him and what do you want? And he said, make me so intelligent that I can beat everybody. You know, like the most intelligent person there. And the Divine Mother said, all right. That's the result which is promised here. Now he became very, very super intelligent. I mean, even the, what is that society? The Mensa society or something? Yes. Yeah. They would be dumb compared to him. That's how intelligent he got. Now comes the second problem. He became so intelligent and he was able to defeat everybody. Only thing is... He was so intelligent, nobody knew what he was saying. They couldn't understand him at all. Now, if you defeat somebody in a debate, in an argument, and don't, they don't understand your arguments, they don't think they're defeated at all. So, nobody felt that they were defeated by him. This was not working out well. So, he goes back again and prays to the Divine Mother, and she appears, now what? Uh, and he, he says, could you dial it down a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> That's how you say it in America. How could you dial it down a little bit? Step it down. The Divine Mother said, well, we can do two things. Um, she recommends a particular dal. Um, <laughs> it's, I forget. I'll tell you. It, it's supposed to make someone tamasic. Which one? No, no, I don't know. I don't yeah, yeah. Yes, right. A particular dal which, which makes you... Um, tamasic, dal. So you said you, you uh, take more of that dal with, with your rice. <laughs> Once they made, I told this story to the novices in Belurmat, and lo and behold, that afternoon that particular dal was made, and the brahmacharis refused to. <laughs> I said, it's just a story, go ahead, eat, a, I mean, drink as much of it as you want, it's not going to harm you. Uh, that's one. And the second thing the Divine Mother recommended was there's a particular kind of berry. So you, it's supposed to be toxic. So you sit under that creeper, that berry, the creeper, and then you write your books. So it will really make you dull. And so he wrote the book, his masterpiece, Khandana Khanda Khadya, the, the cookies of refutation, or the sweet meats of refutation. And that turns out to be the most notoriously difficult book in um, all of Advaita literature. Even now, if you, you can Google it, it, it's literally it's a book to fry your brain. Every verse there has a double meaning. I mean, each word can be interpreted in multiple ways. So I wonder what he was before he was dialed down. <laughs> uh, you have to know Sanskrit to understand the beauty of that, that composition. He is also the co uh, composer of one of the greatest dramas in Sanskrit uh, literature, Naishada Charitam. Sri Harsha, Naishada Charitam. Um, so, that's the point. You can practice this, this meditation and the, one of the results will be you excel in knowledge. The other result will be Samanascha Bhavati. Uh, this person becomes equally acceptable to all others. That means becomes a kind of a peacemaker. You know, friends and enemies uh, like the same per the, the person. Shankaracharya in his commentary says he does not become an object of envy to his enemies just as he's not to his friends. So he's equal to everybody. Everybody likes this person. So you want to win, you want to get lots and lots of likes on Facebook, you should do this meditation. You'll become very popular on Facebook. Then the other result, another, another result is promised. Promised. Nasya Brahmavit Kule Bhavati. Not only this person, but his lineage or his clan or his school of thought. It could, be, it could mean anything. Um, there will be no, it will never be devoid of knowers of Brahman or they will all become knowers of Brahman in that sense. You might mean, it might mean not literally a knower of Brahman, it might mean his, uh, his children or his 
members of his clan or his school, they will all be very wise or very accomplished. It might mean in a general sense also. Ya evam Veda. Veda means, literally means knows, but here it means one who practices this meditation. Remember, practicing this meditation means not that you are going to sit and chant ah or sit and chant ooh. I have told this earlier. It means you are going to chant Om, but do the whole meditation. Now we go on to the 11th mantra. Sushupta sthana Pragya makara Tritiya matra Miter apiter va Minoti Hava idagum sarvam Apitischa bhavati Ya evam Veda. Eleventh mantra deals with associating deep sleep with M. Sushupta sthana, the deep sleep experience. What are you in deep sleep? What are you called? You, the consciousness, you are called Pragya in deep sleep. And at a cosmic level, when the universe is dissolved, God alone exists with Maya, consciousness exists with the power of Maya, that consciousness will be called. Ishwara. So what does it mean? Pragya with the deep sleep sphere associated with mm. three points again. What are we to associate what with? So associate deep sleep with mm. um, the second point is why? How do you associate? What are the connections? Here it says Miter Apiterva. Because of two reasons. Because it measures or because of absorption. Because of absorption, that's easily explained. What is the similarity? In deep sleep, your experience is the waking world and the dream world are all absorbed in the deep sleep experience. Absorbed means dissolved, resolved. See, the deep sleep is not that the waking world is not there. Not that the dream world is not there. Not that the physical world or the subtle worlds are not there. They are just covered in ignorance. It's like switching off the lights. Because the moment you wake up, it's all back again. So it's there. So deep sleep is like that. It's the place where everything is absorbed. At the time of cosmic dissolution, when the universe comes to an end, so the entire physical universe, the subtle universe, all are absorbed back into Maya. And God exists alone, alone with Maya. So because of absorption. How, do you, uh, how, how is it related to M? Mm? Again, easy to understand. Uh, the, all the sounds, you can see, they finally, what do you do? Close your lips, uh, ooh, whatever sound you make. And then finally, M. Mm. So they are all as if absorbed back into yourself. So that is absorption. Because all sounds are finally absorbed. And the sound you make while absorbing them and pulling them back is M. Mm. Similarly, the waking world, physical world, dream world, subtle world are all absorbed in your deep sleep. That's why you relate them, yeah. I still don't get the, the rationale for the association of this side with that side in the sense that why mm should be deep sleep? I mean, is it an injunction more than a rationale? Yeah, you, you, can, you, can, do, you can do that. Uh, but the rationale is used only to help you to associate. See, these are the reasons, you saw the reasons which were given, why a uh, should be associated with waking. Because it's the first sound of Om and waking is, the Virat is the first manifestation, manifestation of uh, Brahman. That way, that's an uh, association. It might not work too well with modern people, it would work with Vedic people because that's how they thought of uh, God and the world. So the... Remember, these rationals are not meant for to explain anything. They are only meant to help us to associate. Mm -hmm. If you are fine with, they say that, think of the entire waking universe, put it on a uh, and meditate. Meditate means stay with it. You see, I am okay with that. You don't have to explain it too much. Fine, go ahead. But if you want a similarity, they will give you a similarity. 
in that sense. So what is the similarity between deep sleep and mm? Absorption. Oh, uh, all finally get absorbed in mm, and the waking, dreaming, all get absorbed in deep sleep. The other rationale given here, mitehe, it measures. That requires a little bit of explanation. It's rather cute, actually. Uh, why, how do you, what is the similarity between the two? Okay. To understand this, I guess it was clear to the rural folk, you know, the simple folk of the Vedic times, because it's something they saw all the time and we don't see it too much. A measure, mite means measure, miti means measure. A measure works like this. Even now in some Indian villages, I guess, I have seen it myself also. If you go to purchase rice, for example, the shopkeeper will have a measure, like a cup. Yeah? Like a cup, a measure. What the shopkeeper does is, suppose you want rice, you've gone with your sack, you want rice for your uh, family. The shopkeeper brings out his store of rice and he pours it out like this, makes a big um, mound of rice. And now he has got his cup. Then he asks, how many measures do you want? You say 10. What the shopkeeper will do is, he will take 10 cups. He'll put a um, cup in it. He will pour it into, one, into, into the cup until it's full. And then pour it out on your side. Then empty it at your side. And then again fill it up from this side, from his store. And empty it on your, in your bag or on your side until 10 cups are transferred to your side and then you pay him. Now, here's the thing. If you actually closely watch this, you know what's happening? It's as if the rice on this side, it disappears and it appears again, right? It's, it, it gets poured into the cup and it reappears. That's what it looks like. Only take that much. That's the whole <laughs> explanation. It seems, I guess it was a very easy example to give to people in those days. Or in rural places, uh, in villages, people would still understand. But it sounds complicated to us because we don't see it in action. It's very simple. It gets poured in. If you see the shopkeepers, they're experts. It's like they, it comes out of it and then it go, they go very fast. It gets poured in and poured out. Just keep that in mind. Poured in, it poured in, disappears, poured, uh, poured out, it appears again. Now, when you look at your waking, dreaming and deep sleep, Think about it this, this way. This whole universe here, this is the physical universe. And this whole universe here, thoughts, ideas, feelings, you know, your whole personal identity, the person here, subtle universe. It's as if all of it gets poured into a cup in deep sleep. And it's not visible anymore. But it's all there. Next morning it gets all poured out. And you have a waking world. And a, um, a, a dream world, a physical world, and a subtle world. Do you see? This entire universe is poured. Look at your own experience. Can you imagine it like a, like a measuring cup? Where everything is poured in into and it all disappears. Your world has disappeared. Your dream, your deep sleep experience. Your physical world has disappeared. Your inner world has disappeared. And there's blankness. But you know it's all there. You don't experience anything. And then it suddenly seems to pour out again. Right? Um, you can, if you can think of your waking, dreaming, deep sleep in that way. We normally don't think about it that way. We think, I have fallen asleep. It's all there. I have fallen asleep. Now I wake up and see it. We look at it that way. But try to look at it this way. <laughs> now it makes sense. Just as your waking and dreaming and all disappear into deep sleep. And, in the sa and then reappear again when you wake up. Similarly, when you chant Om, oh, where are the sounds? Oh, and ooh, and everything. Everything is in. And again, you open your mouth. Oh, so everything gets poured into the. Everything gets in there when you close your lips. When you open your lips, all other sounds come out. Oh, ooh, ee, ee, all of them. And when you close your lips, as if all the sounds are there, but they have been poured in. You have swallowed them, eaten your words. <laughs> mm, all in there. So, I had to go through all this explanation, but actually it's a simple example. And it's a cute example also. 
a meter means measuring because of measuring it's like everything being poured into deep sleep and coming out of it everything being uh, all uh, all sounds being absorbed into um and then or being poured into um and then coming out of it because of that connect pragya the deep sleeper with um ishwara or antaryami with the deep sleeper uh, with with um so that's the these are the reasons and what do you get what do you get the results again remember worldly results spiritual result worldly result minoti havaidagam sarvam this person can measure the universe has perfect judgment about everything in the universe so that is a crucial factor in su- succeeding in the world you have perfect judgment about everything people and events and situations in your life in other people's lives you can be a top class management consultant or somebody so you have perfect judgment about everything and apitishcha and you are the ground of resolution of all problems everything comes and gets absorbed in you i guess you can yeah again a counselor you can solve everybody's problems everything disappears all things disappear in you all problems disappear in you shankaracharya gives a deeper spiritual meaning uh, even in the worldly results he says you become identified with ishwara ishwara is which at the time of cosmic dissolution the entire universe is pulled in retracted absorbed in ishwara you become one with ishwara um, by this meditation you feel a oneness with god that's also not the ultimate spiritual gain the ultimate spiritual gain is beyond ishwara you realize that you are turiyam so the second result would be the real result which we are looking for is you realize you are turiyam and thus now we have been taught how to associate three of the matras of om with three of the padas of the atma right did you have you had a question no so this is just an exercise it helps you to absorb uh, to assimilate the teaching you chant the om a prolonged low om physically or mentally and associate mentally the whole physical universe disappears the whole inner life disappears the whole blankness also drop that beyond that you cannot express this is the realm of language this is the universe physical universe subtle universe causal universe uh, language a u m a it represents language you go beyond language you, you go beyond the universe to what you are you you really are that pure consciousness do it repeatedly till the locus of the i i is who who we are normally it's related to the waker i am this person till it shifts to turiyam to that consciousness <coughs> so you can confidently say i am the witness consciousness in the waking state you, you can say i am not this body and mind yeah so that's the whole technique now before we come to the end of the upanishad gaudapada will now take a break a karika break like a coffee break he is going to give us some verses and the verses yeah Yes. Over and over and over again every time I am. Right. You associate it and when you repeat om it gets repeated again and again till the association becomes strong. So that when you repeat the om mentally um you rotate these experiences. As a result what happens is you first of all two results you know what will happen is you will become dissociated with these things. Right now we are in the midst of it with one body and mind we are in the midst of this waking world and I think I am this one. As you repeat it you will see quite clearly body it has come and gone in my awareness and in me the awareness the body has arisen and um, disappeared so many times every day it comes and goes in my awareness. Am I a body with consciousness? or am i a consciousness to which a body appears and i use the body to exist in a physical world you will see this latter one which might seem a very radical claim 
seems more and more as a as a fact it is something that's already there once you make that shift from a body with consciousness to consciousness experiencing a body then you see a tremendous change comes over you that already it will make a big change most of the problems of the physical world and body related problems you will get a gap between yourself and your problems it gives you room to maneuver it gives you room to rest it gives you some room to step back it saves you most of all from the great fear of death body is going to die there's no doubt about it but you the consciousness to you how many times the body dies every day it dies to you when you are just when you do this you will see oh to me it appears body and its way, its world to me it appears the mind and its dreams to me it appears the blankness the nothingness of deep sleep you begin to appreciate what you are that pure consciousness to which everything appears so that will be the first step a separation between you and these three worlds the second step will be even more profound you will realize you are all these worlds what are those worlds are they something separate from you which which they come and go and you sit separately and experience no you are the consciousness in which they arrive like waves in an ocean the waves are not separate from the ocean they arise in the ocean they exist in the ocean and disappear back into the ocean the waking person and his or her world arises in you the ocean of consciousness exists in you and disappears back within you the dreams the world of the dreams the private world of of the mind inside it arises in you shines in you and disappears back in you you are the witness of the body and the mind also the subtle universe how many times you will see the mind has awakened functioned gone back to sleep yet i continue i the pure consciousness i continue in me the mind awakens so i am not the mind first thing the i identification will move from the mind to the pure consciousness it will move from the body to pure consciousness will move from the mind to pure consciousness mm-hmm. not only am i not a body with consciousness and the consciousness in which the body appears not only not i am not a mind i am the consciousness in which the mind appears also what a great freedom be rest assured the mind will exist and function as it is supposed to do but if you are not the mind then you are free of the mind not that you will become mindless the m- mind will still be there but you are not the mind it doesn't define you doesn't restrict you you are not its slave it appears within you it's an instrument to be used it's a nice thing a nice little app to be used it comes up it exists shines it helps you work in this world it gives you dreams at night and it disappears in deep sleep how many times the mind has arisen how many times you, know, you see happiness coming and going uh, irritation coming and going uh, um vivekananda goes so far as to say i was reading yesterday control of the mind let it be uncontrolled what is it to me i want a peaceful mind in deep meditation why good if it's peaceful good if it's not peaceful it has nothing to do with me it will disappear anyway the holiest the noblest of thoughts which you cultivate the sublimest experiences which you will have they'll go away and so will the most miserable low thoughts will go away now the going away is not important it shows that it's not you you continue you were there before them you are there to experience them you are there after them tell me one thought tell me one state of mind which has continued till today nothing it lasts for seconds minutes if you cultivate it deeply with a lot of meditation and prayerful you'll have a deep feeling of bhakti maybe the best thing that you can cultivate in a mind a deep devotion to god but many times in a day you will still not think of god and definitely when you fall asleep and go to deep sleep it'll all go away anyway so i am not the mind does not mean again warning that you will not cultivate bhakti you will not meditate you will not pray do all of that it's good to have a nice mind a spiritual mind than a worldly mind a troubled mind a depressed mind it's much better even vedanta becomes possible when the mind is good 
So continue your project. One Swami says it's a nice project to spend your time with. You, you refine the mind, make it sattvic, make it spiritual. But at all times, spiritual, non-spiritual, you are free of the mind. It's not you, not even your mind. You are not responsible for it either. It's God's creation, this entire universe, God's projection. If you need an accounting for it, no, but it's still there. I need to know what is it then. If it's not me or mine, it's Ishwara's creation. You didn't create it. You are not maintaining it. It, it, and you will have no control over it. It will go away. So you are not the mind. The locus of the I shifts from the body and the mind to pure consciousness. And yet, you all minds are you. They arise in you after all. Just like all waves are the ocean. So you are one with all minds and all bodies and all beings. See, first it frees you from the prison of one body and mind. And then it shows you that all bodies and minds, everything, they are all appearances in you. So you are everything. You are this entire universe. And yet being free from it. Sri Krishna says, this is the great secret. In the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, he says, I'll reveal to you a great secret. What's the great secret? This entire universe in, is in me. He says, one. One. And second, lo and behold, the entire universe is not in me. This, if you can understand these two together, what Manduki Upanishad says here is, the entire universe is in you and lo and behold, it is not in you. Just as how the snake is in the rope, true, because the snake, the snake is nothing but the rope, but really, really speaking, is there a snake in the rope? No. Is the rope free of the snake? Forever. Right, in that sense. So you are the Turiyam. Yes. It seems like the right column is, is the state that you experience in deep meditation. The right column? This waking state, hmm? the gross, the gross pers perspective of the word, yes. the subtler perspective of the word, hmm. the subtlest perspective of the word. We we'll call it the causal, yeah. That, that blankness also, yeah. And whosoever came up with this, hmm. the left column, was probably trying to represent the, those states of deep meditation in a way where they had no tool to express it. Hmm. And the only way they could express is using sound of the five senses. Hmm. Sound was perhaps the only tool they could use hmm. to relate it back to that state of meditation. Hmm. And... And what happens is this itself acquires a life of its own. The sound acquires it. Mm. And sometimes there is a distance from the experience of meditation mm. to how sound is represented. One thing I will take a, I will um, point out there. It's not supposed to be, these are not supposed to be something that you experience in deep meditation. This waker in the waker's world is what we are experiencing now without meditation. What you are experiencing now, whether you do one minute's meditation or not, this is what is called the waker and the waker's universe. This is what you should associate with. Uh, right? Why do you need to meditate to experience your life? What you are saying is, these, this can be used for meditation on these. This is supposed to be used for meditation on this. Because the first thing that goes away in meditation is the gross world goes away. You, once you experience the subtle, the gross has to dissolve. Mm -hmm. When you experience the subtler, even more subtle, then mm -hmm. the subtle has to dissolve. Mm -hmm. And when the subtlest dissolves, there is nothing. Mm -hmm. and, there is, and if somebody has had that experience, there is no way for them to relate it to or convey it to the world. Just like if somebody hasn't had, you know, how do you convey it? True. And I and this is my spirit, that they, these are just a tool where they you can't represent it visually that mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. no other of, of the five senses the other four senses are useless mm -hmm. yes the only sense that works is the sound yeah and 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 maybe that is just the representation of that true experience. true That's why. Uh, because after all what is the upanishad word 
the the shruti means the wisdom is conveyed through words so the upanishads are texts are words they are trying to convey something through language which cannot even be conveyed through language and in those texts also the most concise way to convey that is the mahavakya you are brahman in this upanishad we saw a mahavakya do you remember what it is i am atma brahma this very self is brahman even more concise way of conveying that same truth is om not even the final way do you remember kathopanishad where the little boy goes to the the lord of death and asks for the ultimate truth and then what does the lord of death do it's not it's not mandukya upanishad he has a lot of space to play about with so the lord of death yama tempts the boy and tries to divert him and then yeah, uh, nachiketa rejects all the temptations and finally says i want to know that highest truth and finally yama when yama tells him the high, highest truth you know how he tells him what you are looking for is om and this and all of that is set aside in the mandukya upanishad it just goes straight to the fact that it is om and what is om all these things yes you can see that om is basically if you expand om you will come to these things this is basically an account of the universe which we know and all of these things are used to point to something we do not know yet the pure consciousness the pure consciousness is re- represented by om one way of using om is the meditation is the hindu way of using symbols for spiritual concepts so the image of ganesha is a symbol on which you superimpose the idea of the lord ganesha and then you meditate the shiva linga is the symbol for the lord shiva and you superimpose the idea of lord shiva superimpose means associate and then meditate this is lord shiva now you do that to a is your entire universe waking universe associate put it on that and meditate and u is your entire inner world dream universe your mind and all of that m mm. is your absolute blankness of deep sleep put it on that om is your entire experience of life beyond the uh, om sound om is the silence the amatra it is called the amatra prathama matra ditiya matra tritiya matra first matra second matra third matra and the chaturtha fourth matra is amatra on that silence you associate with the the inexpressible consciousness behind waking dreaming and deep sleep this is the technique yes we need not to close the eyes to do the association yeah you need not need not vedantic meditation you can do it open eyes with closed eyes also but it's good if you do with closed eyes because the whole thing is to make a breakthrough yeah. once you have got it you can do it with open eyes with closed eyes also practically when you need to understand something what do you do you close your eyes and think about it or you want to appreciate classical music or something what do you do you close your eyes and listen to it carefully the more you are practically the more you got your eyes open the more of your cognitive capacities are connected with the visual part of your brain so if you shut it down it frees up a lot of cognitive resources uh, you need a lot of bandwidth a lot of cpu power to make this breakthrough but once you made this breakthrough it's actually a pretty simple truth which you're trying to say which they're trying to point to once you get it you've got it again you will not be able to express it <laughs> if they say you got it now you teach it to me and say so you have to go to the mandukya <laughs> i can't teach better than that right i was think yes please sit this where does atma come in please sit ah so, yeah okay say you are waking ah. you are sleeping you have, uh, have you been coming to the class or this no. f- <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So this is the atma. What is atma? The self, you, yourself, right? Atma means you yourself. What do you think is you? What what do you think you are? Our usual answer is this body and mind. This is who I am. If you ask what are what are you? This. So this is what he calls the waking self, the vishwa. The whole Upanishad is about the atma. What is the atma the Upanishad says the atma has four aspects atma has one aspect which is 
the waking self right now what you think of yourself sir right now this is the this that, that's the first aspect of the atma what you think of yourself your conception about yourself your experience of yourself and the universe in your dreams that is the second aspect of the atma how you experience yourself and your conception about deep sleep when everything is erased or covered in darkness in deep sleep that is the third aspect of the self now these three aspects of the self upanishad says they are well known we all experience them daily nothing new to know there upanishad just labels them first aspect second aspect third aspect this is what you know you say, yeah this is your universe yes now let me show you something beyond these aspects that is the fourth that's the seventh mantra of the upanishad which we have done um, which which uh, points out the fourth and knowing that for knowing that fourth means knowing yourself to be that fourth not any of these three aspects these three aspects are appearances of the fourth they are not the reality the fourth is the reality so what will happen is your sense of self i will shift from these three to the fourth your sense of reality what's real will shift shift from this world is real it will shift from this world to the fourth then you will be able to say brahma satyam jagat mithya brahman alone is real the world is false what is the world the waking world gross the dream world subtle the deep sleep world causal this gross subtle causal world this three aspected world false it's an appearance appearance of what of me brahman and jiva brahma eva napara the individual being this waker vishwa is none other than brahman this you realize yes i want to go back if, if you don't mind to an analogy you have used often which is the gold in the necklace same as the gold in yeah. the ring yeah. right now um i can measure that I can measure the gold. Uh, you know, I, I have knowledge of the gold. I, it's got it's a metal. It's an element. It's got an atomic number, etc. Oh, oh. So I can compare it to that and say, yes, it is the same thing in the ring as in the as in the necklace. But how do I? Since you cannot measure Brahman, Naturium, or mm. anything like that, mm. how do I know that what enlivens me, this body mind, also enlivens, is the same thing? if if the knowledge is not there in fact it seems to be a negation of knowledge not this not this not this hmm. so right two points here first of all you're still treating it as an object there is gold here there's gold here let me see if there's same kind of gold why not suppose i change the example the same gold is made into a necklace melted made into a ring melted and made into um, a bracelet would you still have to measure anything no because you know it's the same substance it's always was that's the only point they are not concerned with atomic numbers or with they, they are not talking about that they are only saying that you know it's the same substance the person who understands what the what the substance is in spite of change of name change of form change of function nama rupa vyavahara changes you know it's the same same substance are you with me so far the example must be understood first yes right now for you look at your own experience your own experience it's the same you are it's pointing out to one consciousness which appears with all of this as the waking world which appears with all of your dreams as your dream world which appears with when all of this subsides as the deep sleep experience that one consciousness but how do i know it's the same thing for you <laughs> Look at it this way. Um I mean you haven't been melted down and made into me or what? Mm-hmm. You still How much you wouldn't it be that you appear in his consciousness? Of course, that yeah. now I'm saying I'm coming to in it in two different ways. That's one that's the easiest way out of course. But um but uh, imagine this. I that answer which she gave you are taking me as something separate from you but where do you see me this objective approach you see this is the problem the objective approach is where you start with an object 
and you conveniently ignore it's an object in your awareness. You're starting with this and that, but both this and that appear to you the consciousness. For example, if I suppose I asked you, in your dreams, when you see yourself and many others in your dream, after waking up, when you look back upon the dream, would you ever even consider thinking that, all right, I was there in the dream and I know I was conscious in the dream, there was a consciousness in me, but all those other people in the dream, um, how do I know that the same consciousness was in them? You would never ask such a question because you are completely sure all those other people in the dream were generated by your own mind. There are absolutely no existence apart from your mind. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Alright. So the direct answer which Vedanta would give in the waking state also is exactly that. All of this that you experience, is it not experienced in consciousness? Hmm? In your consciousness? So, so, so the point of this exercise is to actually awaken from the waking state. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it, to awaken from the waking state. The waking state is also compared to a dream. Gaurapada said that, a little while ago it said, there, there are only two states, sleeping and dreaming. What is dreaming? Waking is dreaming, dreaming is dreaming. And deep sleep is sleep. Remember, dreaming, waking and dreaming are said to be states of ignorance and error. D deep sleep is said to be a state of ignorance only. Awaken from ignorance, automatically you awaken from error also. That's, that's called waking up. Now, but you see, everything is in consciousness. This is a radical point, but Advaita, that's the direct answer that Advaita will give. I'll give you a second answer, which if it's not acceptable, this is, if it's too much to swallow, I'll give you a second more commonsensical approach. But this is the real answer which Advaita wants to give. If you really understand Advaita, you will see it is all an appearance in your consciousness. One Swami put it very clearly. Um, I'll tell you in Hindi and translate. He said, uh, se anubhav se shuru karo. Se mat karo. Se shuru karoge, to hi milega. Don't start with insentient objects. If you start your analysis with insentient objects, you will get, ma if you start with matter, you will get matter. Start with experience. Analyze that. You will come back to consciousness. You might say, why? Why should I not start with matter? After all, scientists start with matter. Remember, this is the way, place where scientific method uh, have, begins to fail. Why? I, you see, that's a big, <laughs> big thing to say. I'll say why. You see, the scientific method was made to study ob the objective universe. The thing out there, empirical universe. And there, as much as you eliminate the subjective component, the better your results are. Right? That's why to be objective is something, is something that's good in science. It's a value in science to be objective. So it's become part of our thing. Be objective. In Vedanta, it's a dirty word. <laughs> be objective is immediately infected with error and ignorance. What Vedanta points out is, when you're going to study, what is this going to studying? The self. When you're studying yourself, a conscious entity. You have to study consciousness. Start with experience, anubhava. Vedanta points out something interesting. Even when you study an object, see, suppose you want to study this. What is this? You describe it, you will say it's a book. Vedanta will say, wait, is that a, that's one description. Isn't it better to say it's a book in my awareness? Isn't it a book? Isn't it better to say it's a book that I'm seeing? Which is a more complete description of the truth? It's a book. It's a book that I'm seeing. Which is more complete? Second one. Vedanta will say when you take a purely objective view of something, you are already in error. You have left out a very vital part of it. What have you left out? Yourself. You have left yourself out of the equation. Normally it does not matter and normally it's good when you are doing science. When you're studying with materials, when you're trying to study an objective universe out there, an empirical universe, it's good to leave the subjective component out. It'll just complicate matters. But when you're studying yourself, to leave yourself out of it, it leads to disaster. And that's where consciousness studies is stuck today. 
it's a horrible mess because they try to make it objective a thing you will never get consciousness as a thing because everything is in consciousness it's like trying to understand not understanding gold and trying to understand the ornaments you cannot i'll come to you so when you when you're studying yourself the self it must be you start with with a with a conscious exper experience immediately you will come back to um it, it this will work it will take you back to the reality the original thing is the saying was jad se shuru mat karo jad se shuru karoge to jad hi milega anubhav se shuru karo you understand the hindi right don't start start with matter you will end up with matter you land with matter you uh, you see what what's wrong with that it's not that ending with matter is anything wrong with ending with matter it, because it's a lie you're leaving out something essential that's why um, people studying consciousness recently they have come to such ridiculous ideas i mean a, a completely crazy ideas like we don't have a mind are they zombies there is no such thing as consciousness what are you experiencing and there is no such thing as experience also there is only bodies but it's patently false the first experience anybody has even the word experience presupposes consciousness why do they come to such a ridiculous state of affairs because they are starting with the objective and they think that is the only reality they forget themselves they leave themselves out of the equation you will say that no no swami you are making a mistake themselves well, ourselves is also objective yes but what's objective about yourself the body even the mind is an object they have not come to this kind of understanding yet the, i'll come to you the the classic um, i'll give you one funny story which happened uh, one of our swami atmapriyanand ji he was here so he was giving a lecture in calcutta university uh, there is an annual vivekananda lecture there so he was talking about the mandukya upanishad waking dreaming deep sleep uh, and in deep sleep the world is not there the body is not there the mind is not there and one professor in the crowd uh, in the audience he stood up indignantly he was a professor of physiology he stood up what do you mean in deep sleep body is not there the fellow is there sleeping and snoring we can see him the whole point is what do you the the mandukya experience is from your own experience from your own standpoint this is an analysis of the self what how, what does the self experience in deep sleep when you say the body is there and sleeping that's a real you already assumed that the body is the self and the body is sleeping actually it's the self which is sleeping yeah. and the body you are experiencing is in your waking state okay yes sorry to to frame it the exact opposite way hmm Anything. There is nothing without consciousness. Yeah. But let's flip that argument and say, mm. consciousness by itself. If all you had was pure consciousness, what would it be, and how could it? If there were only objects, if there were no subjects, mm. how would? What would that end result be? No, you mean if there are only subjects and no objects? Yeah, yeah. If there are only subjects and no objects. Yeah. Right. If there was, so, yeah, it, it would it would be something like deep sleep. But remember one thing: what Advaita? I mean, like True, but remember something. We all, you know, the end state. What would but remember one thing: one, one, remember one thing. This entire world, this entire world, according to Bandukya, ultimately, see, if you say if you separate consciousness from everything, then your question becomes valid. Then what is consciousness in itself apart from everything else? it's like asking what is gold apart from the ornaments it's still the reality but my point my answer there would be the things which you are separating the ornaments they are nothing but gold they are expressions of gold the entire universe is you it's not that there is an universe apart from which i can get in touch with it i can get apart from it no when you get apart from the universe there is no universe this is what mandukya wants to say in fact you will say that the consciousness i'm i'll paraphrase your question consciousness devoid of its object seems to be empty and barren a nothingness it's like saying gold devoid of the ornaments is nothing rather the ornaments devoid of the gold are nothing 
Rather the waves devoid of the uh, water are nothing. Water is real. Gold is real with respect to the waves and the ornaments. Uh, but you stay still, there is no variety. There is no difference. There is no... To answer that, I will say, all this variety, all this difference, that's also this, none other than this pure consciousness. This entire universe is the richness of the pure consciousness which you are. The ultimate, uh, um, the conclusion of Vedanta is not that there are two things, a universe and Turiyam. This is also an analysis. Analysis means separating, splitting, to understand. Once you have understood, what will happen is the reality is Turiyam, which is experienced in all these ways. So your entire waking experience is maintained in its entirety. You don't lose one atom of this universe. Your entire dream experience is maintained in its entirety. All thoughts, memories, um, good, bad, everything is maintained. And deep sleep, the restfulness of deep sleep, the blankness of deep sleep is maintained. All of that is maintained and it's shown to be none other than you yourself. That's a much more advantageous position to be than to be one little player in the middle of a vast, uncaring physical universe. Mm. So you are the universe and you are also m much more than the universe. The, the universe is like nothing to you. It, it appears in you like, like no ornament is of any importance to the gold itself. But if there is only gold, if there is only thorium, yeah. then the rest of the universe is meaningless. Uh, again, you are repeating the same thing. What the rest of the what? Oh, you mean say the rest of the universe. Oh, I see. I see what you mean. It, it, it's, it's a good point to say. Only Turium is the universe meaningless. The universe is given meaning because of Turium. Right now, we are constructing meaning from our perspective. That I am a little body-mind, here is the world, and I have meaning in the world. And it's a desperate quest. Uh, this is the whole quest. We, we are meaning-making creatures. We live on meaning. If you deprive human beings of meaning, they die. That was Viktor Frankl's understanding, you know, the man's quest for meaning in that, how he survived the concentration camps in Second World War. Uh, he found those who had meaning in their lives got strength to survive. Those who had no meaning, they, they fell apart. Now, religion is a way of trying to make sense and meaning of the world, a place in the world for ourselves. The whole terrifying problem about the attack of science on religion is that it we don't care so much about our stories about our mythologies what it deprives us of is me of me is meaning and that's what terrifies us now you say but if turiyam is the only reality there's no meaning rather you become the locus of all meaning you are the one which gives existence and value to this universe you don't depend on the universe to construct meaning. The whole universe depends upon you for existence, for revelation, your consciousness after all, and for meaning. The meaning aspect is in the ananda, the bliss. Sat, you are existence itself. You give existence to the universe. It's not matter which gives existence to you. It's reversed. Chit, pure consciousness. You reveal the universe. It's not matter which generates consciousness in you. Reversed. And Ananda, bliss, you are the source of all happiness, bliss, meaningfulness in this universe. It's not that you have to seek somewhere in a vast, uncaring, unforgiving universe for meaning. This is what it means. From this perspective, all of religion is an imperfect approach to this grand conclusion. All of religion, they are desperately trying to show that... Spirituality is more important than materialism, that there is a God which is more important than the world and there is that religious purpose and meaning are more important than uh, materiality and meaninglessness. But um, it's sort of halfway house. That's why it's so vulnerable to attack from science. This is, this is a firm foundation. Yes. So I mean, there is a problem in physics called the double split experiment mm. where Mm -hmm. And in the absence of an obser conscious observer, the behavior of the photon is like a wave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is, so this is the, perhaps in my, the only way to explain that. Mm. The presence of the conscious observer 
brings the universe in a material form? It could be because a lot of people are trying to relate the latest discoveries in uh, quantum mechanics uh, to Vedantic insights. I don't know enough about uh, physics to make a comment. And I have some monks who are very well placed in the scientific world who would tear me apart if I tried to <laughs> talk quantum mechanics and mathematics without knowing anything about it. So I don't make these comments. Uh, Swami Smarananandaji, who is our president now, at one time, he taught us Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. We were novices. So we used to go to him to study. He, I still remember one comment he made at that time. He said, sometimes monks are too eager. Monks in their enthusiasm are too eager to relate physics and Vedanta. He says, don't do that. Physics is still evolving. If you relate your Vedanta to one set of theories, the day it is discarded, your Vedanta also will be discarded with it. <laughs> The best you can say, you should be honest about it, the best you can say is the latest discoveries of physics have very interesting parallels with Vedantic insights. That's the most you can say. Be conservative about it. Be, um, don't be rash in making judgments. But yes, there are these parallels. Again and again. That's why so many books have been written. Amit Goswami has been writing books about it recently. It started with Fridtjof Capra, uh, The Tower of Physics. And he, I found in one place he writes how that book came to be written. It was a landmark in this kind of um, literature. He was a physicist. Or is, I think. He's, he's a physicist. He was sitting on a seashore once. And he says he had a, like, almost like a mystical experience. He could... He knew, he said, first of all, he says, I know clearly that uh, we are being continuously bombarded with invisible rays from outer space. And there's a rain of these particles flowing through the atmosphere, earth, even my body. You're sitting on a seashore. And all of this is the projection of the interactions of extraordinarily minute and energetic particles and energy fields. I knew all this, he says. And at that day on the beach, probably, he says, that... Uh, this knowledge became reality for me. In one sense, not, not that anything changed, not that he had a vision. It's just that his way of looking at the world shifted, entirely informed by particle physics. And then he said, this is what the Eastern masters in Vedanta and uh, Buddhism have been trying to tell us. And so he wrote that book. Yes, yes. Uh, isn't this just saying um, that we are the fiction of post of the universe that Einstein was looking for, uh, that uh, uh, if we look, uh, that uh, as we exist, we are, uh, as Turiya, uh, we are what uh, uh, Arjun saw when he looked at Krishna, and Krishna uh, 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 showed him the entire universe within himself. So we are the hitching posts of the universe. True. That's one way you can put it, that we are the hitching posts of the universe. And what Arjuna saw was, uh, Krishna revealing himself as the Virat, as because he saw it in the physical universe. If you could see the entire physical universe with its underlying unity, all the billions of people, creatures, planets and stars, not only at this slice of time, all time together, past, present and future, all together at once, we'd be scared. And Arjuna was terrified. <laughs> he said every hair in his body stood in, on, on end. And he prayed and prayed for it. When he got it, he prayed and prayed for it to be taken away. He said, I can't bear it. It's unbearable. Yeah, that is true. It's a, the more you think about it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Hmm. Yes. So, Miti, you were talking about the book versus, and the more precise way to say that is, it, this is a book that is in my consciousness. Hmm. So, if it were not for my consciousness, the book wouldn't exist, right? Uh, two ways of putting it. So the universe, Advaitic way of putting it would be, if it were not for your consciousness, the book wouldn't exist. At this point, a lot of people will protest if you have um, the idea of the, the, the common sense approach to the world. That everything exists, even if I don't see it, things exist. So, they will protest against that. Anyway, go on. Hmm. No, so, the idea is that the universe and everything exists because of the consciousness. Yes. So going back to Deepak's comments about, you know, would it all be empty? That can never occur. Is that correct? All right. There's another point I want to address. Would it all be empty? 
if it's only Turiyam, pure consciousness, would it be empty of, of, uh, of things to see, of experiences to have, of people and birds and Central Park and, and all of this and cookies and all of this, would it be empty? Would it be an empty universe once you realized it? No. no. The emptiness is not bad. Every night you experience an emptiness. You have no objection to deep sleep. So why would you have an objection to an empty universe? But you said, do you think that uh, empty for all time would be very boring? There would be no one to be bored. Remember that. <laughs> Turiyam is not bored. The word boredom would mean nothing. Would mean nothing. It, boredom occurs only when, in, in, when the mind is there. And the mind comes in and dreaming and waking. But the fact is that our consciousness cycles between, or the mind cycles between waking, dreaming and deep sleep. And we have a variety of experiences, physical, subtle and blankness. And it, settles continuous, it cycles continuously. Another way of putting the same question, I'll come to a conclusion. Another way of putting the same question would be, why does Turiyam appear like this? Turiyam could have remained just Turiyam. We have come across this question. In religion, it's the question, why did God create the universe? This is a much more sophisticated philosophical way of asking the same question. Uh, why is, is this one reality, why is it appearing like this? Maya. Maya is an answer, it's a word. It's a word, but it's, it's ignorance, it's, really, because if you look at it. Uh -huh. I, I have answered this in different ways. Gaudapad answered it, the final answer, he, g he gave many answers. Uh, one answer was, it's the play of God. Yeah. Yeah. But if you are strictly philosophical, if you have a sort of dry and non-playing kind of nature, then you would say, why play? Why would God want? That's just a human way of anthropomorphizing God. So another was uh, the law of karma. But you see, even law of karma is, causality is part of this nature, uh, universe. Why would there be a law of karma also? The last one answer was maya. But what did Gaudapada say? Advaita generally stops at maya. Because of maya, this world appears. But Maya is also a word actually. Oh, the final answer given by Gaudapada, do you remember? Devasya Esha, oh, that's there. But Devasya Esha Swabhavayam. If you want a straight answer to your question, alright, let it be appearance. Ma Maya will say it doesn't exist, it looks like this. Well, you can go push it further. Why does it look like that? It need not look like anything. Uh, the answer given by Gaudapada is, this is the very nature of the Turiyam. That's all you can say. It, it appears like this. One Swami, they explained it very nicely. One Swami put it this way. Um, he said, think about it this way. When you look up into the sky, it looks like an inverted blue bowl, a surface. Though there is no surface there. So I am seeing. But it's not a bowl. It's not a surface either. But it looks like that. Now he gives the example of this, this, this example. He says, the nature of the eyes is to see. The nature of the sky or space is to be unseen. You can't, to see basically means a surface must reflect some light. Then only you see a surface. But there's no surface there to see in pure space, just empty space. The nature of space is to remain unseen. The nature of the eyes is to see. Now when you try to see the unseen, what will happen? Illusion. An illusion will come, an error will be generated. You will see, but what you will see does not exist. It's a bowl. And he says, give that example. The nature of consciousness is to know, is to illumine, is to reveal. There is nothing other than consciousness in this universe. What will happen? You will end up knowing something, but what you will end up knowing does not exist apart from you, the consciousness. I think that's a very nice answer. I mean, I really liked it. It's not one of the usual philosophical answers you get. You really, so it's something meeting something else which, and gives rise to an impossible situation and the result is error, illusion. That error illusion is called Maya. There's a word used is Maya. I'll end with a funny story I just remembered. I, I was very fond of Asimov, uh, is a science fiction writer, Isaac Asimov, yeah. as a kid. So he had a book where he has a lot of biographical details were there. And he writes about how he made, met this um, woman who asked him, I think on a park bench or somewhere, who asked him a question. 
that uh, what the usual question um, riddle what will happen if an irresistible force meets an immovable object okay this is a question um, and I thought yes right it's I mean, very difficult to answer and his answer was he said that's easy and she said you're the first one who said it's easy to tell me and he said by definition, moment you say irresistible force, there cannot be an immovable object. By definition, if you say immovable object, there cannot be an irresistible force. So the two can never meet. So, and then he concludes that little piece by saying, that's how I met my wife. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll end here. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanam Astu